We turn now to North America and the First Peoples. This is, as you know, a pretty big place. It's certainly larger than Mesoamerica, and it's also larger than the amount of territory in South America that is usually investigated in terms of pre-Columbian art history. We're going to be looking at most of, but not all of, but most of the North American continent. And we're going to be breaking it down into uh, four divisions that we're going to try and take a look at. And this one, this map right here, is the one that we have in our textbook. I am going to try and use an abbreviation, uh, Native North American Art, for the title of our textbook. And that has a nice breakdown for you, but it's not going to show up in a slide as well as the work on our right, uh, the slide or image on our right. Uh, we're going to be starting with the Desert Southwest shortly, and that's pretty easy to find right here. Then we're going to be going to the east, and I'm going to put both of those chunks together, and I think that works over here on this map. I think you can tell that not everybody maps this exactly the same way. The east, for our purposes, will be the mound tradition as well. Then we're going to tend to turn to the west and pick up some of the plains, the Great Basin, and this chunk of California that's located right there. We're going to have a big finish with the northwest coast, which is a truly amazing place. It's a strip of land that runs all the way up from the border of California up to the panhandle of Alaska and produces some pretty amazing material. Throughout this relatively vast territory, there are a number of shared beliefs. Um, by shared, I mean shared throughout the entire New World. That would be with Mesoamerica and South America as well. One of those is the acceptance in the idea of a tiered universe. The tiered universe will not always be visualized exactly the same way, but it will be based on the same premise. In most of North America, what we're going to have is uh, the watery underworld, uh, and then we're going to have the land. The land is going to be our region, and then we're going to have the sky. There will be some variations depending on which part of the New World you're actually living in in North America. In addition to that, we're going to share with everybody else in the New World the idea of an Axis Mundi uh, world tree, although again, it might not be depicted in exactly the same way. It could be thought of as a tree, and I'll show you a sample in a minute. Um, it could also be thought of a pole, uh, and we'll see that hopefully as well. In addition to that, it could be thought of simply as a shaft of smoke that rises from the hearth and goes up through the smoke hole in your dwelling. So there's more than one way of visualizing it, at least in North America. Let's look. Okay. These are a couple of the images. The one on the left is from our textbook, Figure 1.23. It's Ojibwa, and it is modern. It was made in 1982 with acrylic paint. It is a world tree, and it does follow the idea of an Axis Monday, but it also is a really good expression of what our textbook is referring to when uh, the authors talk about the ability of Native Americans to assimilate and to change and to grow. Uh, for one thing, they're embracing acrylic paints like most other modern painters today, but they're also, in this case, assimilating, blending, mixing, together Christian ideas, which were brought from the Europeans, into their own notion of an Axis Mundi. So as we see here, the trunk of the tree actually has the body of Jesus incorporated on it, his arms draping over the arms of the cross. Uh, at the same time, uh, taking in uh, the animals, the birdies in particular, that we can find in nature and the plants underneath the tree, uh, blending everything together into a, a kind of unified uh, combination of uh, old and new beliefs in North America. The one that's on the right is a modern, in fact, you could buy it on uh, the web today, uh, a rug which comes from the Navajo, and it's an image of a tree of life. It, too, is a plant going upward. Uh, bridging the realms. And then in this case, it would be the roots in the underworld. It would be the stalk in our realm. And then, and this looks suspiciously like a corn plant to me. 
of the corn uh, growing and reaching up to the skies, uh, filled traditionally with life and especially in this case with birdies. There are beings on all three of these levels. Each grouping has a variety of characters, entities, spiritual beings, and they all have power. We as human beings want to be able to connect with them and be able to share that power. We also have the in ability to interact with them. Those beings often are oppositional, and I guess you could say this is very close to the ideas of duality that we focused on so much in South America. Uh, there is often an opposition between the sky and the underworld, for example. You might discover that you're dealing with an eagle embraced in battle with a killer whale. That might be a basic uh, myth that is told and retold, or it might even be part of an origin story. And one of your jobs as a human in the mid-level, which would be the earth or the land, would be to make offerings to connect with these two realms and help to maintain balance. In North America, people lived in an animated world, in an animistic world, where power was all around us where spirit was all around us and where everything had the capacity for a kind of a life force. One of the ways that we could connect with that was through dreams or perhaps through a vision quest. We did want to connect with that world because we hope to draw power from it and perhaps actually make connections and um, enjoy some of the abilities of the spirit beings in the other realms or in the other levels. Well, dreams are a pretty common way of connecting with the world beyond us, with the world of the spirits. For North America, the vision quest is also a particularly important path, and it is something that was practiced throughout North America, so we do need to appreciate it and know about it. In a vision quest, you would attempt to make a connection with a spirit, uh, and you would do this by basically giving up something, suffering to some extent, perhaps going without food, going without sleep, uh, and isolating yourself so that you were also without the comfort of others. The idea is that the spirit entities would then be drawn to you and feel compassion for you and appreciate the effort that you'd put into your sacrifice in order to connect with them. At this point, that spirit entity could indeed contact you, make a connection with you, and from that time forward have a bond with you. You could gain power and perhaps even skills from that being or that entity, and you would want to celebrate that, perhaps with images that would be on your home, perhaps a teepee, perhaps something else, or perhaps on a garment that you wore, perhaps in a tattoo. Uh, you would want to maintain that connection, and you'd also want to share it with others. You'd want to share the knowledge of your connection with others because it gave you prestige. And among the ways you could do that would be through song and dance that celebrated the entity with whom you had connected. This also applies, this belief system also implies the importance of shamanism, and that is definitely present in North America. Uh, the shaman, again, is the individual who can travel along the Axis Mundi to acquire information for us to help us. The shaman is considered to be someone who is positive, who works for the good of the community. Uh, the, the shamans in uh, North America some of them certainly do take drugs, but not all of them do, and it's not always necessary. Drumming, uh, rhythmic beats, for example, are particularly important in allowing the shaman to alter his mental state so that it is easy for him to go into a trance-like state and be able to connect with the realm of the spirits, with the beyond. And I am using the word he it is possible uh, for a woman to be a shaman in North America, but the tendency is that it is a male occupation in, in general, but it's not import, uh, impossible for a, a female to become a shaman as well. Um, one of the other features, I guess we could say it's shared in particular with uh, South America, uh, is the feast. 
Uh, in North America, it was particularly important because when you'd go to a feast, you would get all dressed up and the garments that you would be wearing would say something about your status and also probably would reflect the connection, the spirit connections that you'd made because there might be emblems or indications of the spirit contact with whom you had association. You would also, in these feasts, perhaps engage in ritual performances that would help to recall the connections that you had made and the links, the bonds that you made with the realm of the spirit. We're going to see this is particularly true when we get to the Northwest Coast and where the potlatch is an important part of the cultural cohesion that keeps those folks together.